Welcome to Longhorn Weekly with Coach Sark, presented by the Texas Lottery. Hello again, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Longhorn Weekly with Coach Sark, coming your way from Pluckers, the West Campus location here in Austin, and brought to you by the Texas Lottery. It's always a fascinating dynamic hearing uh, head coaches talk about when you uh, come off a win, what it's like on the practice field the next week, when you come off a disappointment of a loss, what's it like on the practice field and the message to the guys and all of the stuff that has gone into this week coming off of Arkansas and getting ready for Rice. It is. You know, this is a... Uh you know, as much of coaching football as, you know, we think of football as such a physical sport, which it is, it's very psychological. And, um, you know, I think there's a mindset and an intent of the way you have to go about your business every day, regardless of maybe what just occurred or what you think might be lying ahead. And uh, that's something we're trying to instill in the team. Uh, I think we're, we're, we, you know, a point got made, unfortunately, that, that none of us wanted to have happened the way that it did, uh, but there's been real intent this week. And it, every practice, there's, there's, it's never perfect early in the week. You're working through things, you're making adjustments based on the opponent, but I like the intent of the team and the mindset of where we're at right now. You said something interesting in the news conference. It's, it's uh, a coaching axiom, I think I've heard before, I've heard other coaches say it, but I think fans might not completely understand it, and that is, we have to hate losing more than like winning because everybody loves winning. Everybody likes winning, the hate losing, and, and, and how that makes a difference between winning and losing sometimes. Without a, without a doubt. I think, you know, you can, you can listen to some of the greatest competitors we've ever seen, the Michael Jordans, the Kobe Bryants, uh, the Derek Jeters, and a lot of their, lot of their talks, when you listen to them speak, they speak about their, their despise for losing that regardless of the MVPs or the scoring titles or um, you know, getting to a World Series, if they didn't win it, that, that bothered them more than almost if they would have won it, the happiness that they would have felt. Because, what was it Kobe used to say, competitive sickness? Yeah, exactly right. And I, I think we have a team that it is highly competitive. I think we have a team that really loves to win. You know, they want to win. Um, and we're just trying to shift that to we don't want to lose. And I think that we've hired a coaching staff that is driven that way, and you've seen it throughout their career, uh, that you do everything in your power to try to put your players in a position to be successful, mostly because you, you, you don't want to lose. And then the winning part kind of takes care of itself in the back end. And so that's why you, you plan for all of the potential what-ifs that could come in the game um, so that you, you don't ever have a player in position to where – man, I didn't prepare him for that, and that was the reason we lost the game. And I think that when, when we start to prepare that way, you know, collectively I think we're moving in that direction, and the only way we get there is if all individuals understand that kind of idea. Uh, but that's, to me, that's the real notion. I think that's what the great coaches and the great players, not only in football but across sports, think that way and, and not just think that way, really act that way. Someone in the news conference asked you this week about – uh, were there things that surprised you about the game? And you said it's not, it isn't a matter of surprise as much as you've got things ready, you know what you want your guys to do, and then it's a matter of whether it gets executed and, and properly executed in, a, in the, the state of a football game. But it's not necessarily about surprise. It's about execution or lack of execution or being a little bit out of sorts mentally the way you'd expect it. Yeah, I think, you know, inevitably um – you know, we believe in our, as a staff that, that we have the answers to whatever somebody could present to us regardless. You know, we're always prepared for, like I said, the what-ifs. Um, you're going to play a four-down defensive front. They come out and they're playing an odd front. Well, as coaches, we have to make sure that we have things in place that we can put our players in position to be successful. We have to make sure that we practice that enough. Uh, you can't practice everything in a week, but you have to make sure you practice it enough so that if it presents itself – we can make that adjustment on the sidelines and then go out and execute those things. And we weren't able to do that enough Saturday. Um, you know, that, that, was, that was pretty clear. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think we had some opportunities in the game to maybe swing the momentum, uh, and we just missed those opportunities. And, and in a game like that, in that type of environment, you have to try to get momentum back in your favor, and, and we just weren't able to do it. Uh, there's, there's a couple of questions here from, from our folks here in the, the audience that, that kind of speak to what you just talked about here. This, the, here's one uh, here uh, from uh, Scarlett who says, 
when coaching a team and you're implementing your scheme, what are the challenges of making in-game adjustments to a scheme that the players are still learning? Uh, it's Andrew and Kyle asked that. Uh, what, if, if there's, how do you go about making the adjustments when things are still new to your guys? Well, I think that's the, one of the biggest challenges we have, right? Um, when you have a veteran team that has been in a system and you've got, you know, juniors and seniors playing that have been in a system for three or four years, sometimes you can fall back on something that maybe you did a year ago for a game. Hey, remember when we ran X, Y, and Z? All right, this is what we're going to go to now. Well, there is no falling back on anything that, w that we're doing now. It is only what we've given them to prepare for for the game. And so sometimes you, you, know, you don't get to go do some of the things that you normally might want to do that we'll be able to do in a year from now or two years from now. Um, but everything that we had I thought was, was good enough to go win. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't good enough that night. So uh, the, the things that you were telling Mac Jones last year are not the things that you would be telling Hudson Carter, Casey Thompson. A little bit different, right? I mean, and, and not, only, not only the quarterback, but the wide receivers yep. or the offensive line or, or uh, the running back. You know, everybody across the board, and, and that goes for our defense too with Coach PK and, and that group, right? Uh, he's been doing it a long time at Boise State and at Washington and making these little subtle adjustments that we're working towards and we're getting there and we're, we're, we're in a race for, you know, we're chasing greatness every day. But there's just some things that don't, we can't just call it on a whim or a, a quick talk on the sideline, then go do it and expect them to execute it. It might work great if we get that one specific look from the opponent. But if we don't get that look, they may not have all the answers to the formation we get or the, the defensive coverage we get, and that wouldn't be fair to the players. So uh, we have to be cognizant of that. Um, we have to be mindful of it. Um, but that's why we, we continue to prepare and practice the way we do so that we can have enough on our call sheet to make sure that we're putting them in a position to have success. Interesting that you bring that up because I had a conversation with Mike Bloomer and the head coach at Rice yesterday, and he was, he was talking about you and your coaching staff, and he said some very similar things about – how much you can implement and what you want to implement and how much the guys are grasping. And he said, I can see it with what Sark and PK, he said, I'm so used to seeing what PK did at Washington when I was at Stanford, and I know what Sark did at Alabama, and I can see what they're trying to get those guys. Coaches can see that sort of thing, I guess, universally, even as players are trying to grasp. It. Yeah, I've known Coach Bloomgren for a long time with his time at Stanford um, with Coach Harbaugh and Coach Shaw and tremendous coach and it's the same thing when we watch we watch them right um, you can see Stanford's offense under coach Harbaugh um, but clearly you know you have to play to the strengths of your team and the personalities that you have and the style of players that you have um, and that's the work in progress is you know we're, we're trying to do the things that help best our players now and then we're also trying to recruit the players that we know would fit what we want to do as we continue to move forward as a program. Uh, we a question here from uh, Jean, one of our biggest fans always, who wanted to ask since we were talking about Arkansas. She said, in Fayetteville, was the degree of hostility toward Texas any different than in any environment you'd had at Alabama, it's been uh, stated that Arkansas uh, dislikes Texas as much as they love Arkansas. That's kind of a corollary to what you were <laughs> saying earlier. But, I mean, you, you've been in the Iron Bowl. You coach that, so Alabama yeah. and Auburn's a pr pretty heated thing as well. Well, I, th I think this, you know, when, you, when you're at a University of Texas or you're at a you know, University of Alabama, um, you could probably put Ohio State in that category. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and maybe maybe put a USC in that category. I mean, there's probably, you know, five to six schools around the country that are in a little bit of a different stratosphere when it comes to when you come to town, there's a level of we really don't like you because we're not you, essentially, right? Yep. And, and I think that was no different than Arkansas. What an amazing environment, first yep. of all. I thought they did a tremendous job of creating an unbelievable game day atmosphere. Uh, the student section, the crowd was fired up. They were, they were supportive. Um, but that's what you love about college football is to go play in those environments and in those games. And we'll be better the next time we, we get that opportunity. Yeah, it, it kind of brings it back full circle to what we were talking about earlier about uh, the players and, and disliking, hating losing more than liking winning when they get a full dose 
of being hated on the road. It's like, it's going to be like this for you week in, week out. It's going to be like this, obviously, when Texas is in the SEC. I mean, that's, that's an expectation that, that will evolve with them, won't it? Without, without a doubt. I, I think that you have to, when you go on the road, you have to embrace the role of the villain because that's really what you are. When, when you go into somebody else's house and you're trying to take what they want and what they have, you, you're really the villain at that moment. And you have to embrace that. You have to embrace that role um, for that day. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you just have to know you're not getting a lot of pats on the back. You're not getting a lot of high fives coming off the field. You're not getting a lot of kids asking for autographs and throw me your wristband. I mean, you, you might get a few other un, un, unkind words and uh, things thrown your way, but the reality of it is that's, that's great. You got to love that, you know, and that's what, that's what we're working towards. All right. We have a lot to get to on the program. Hey, want to remind Longhorn fans that luck happens with the Texas lottery. Congratulations to Brandon Lee, who won Longhorn prizes and Texas lottery scratch tickets. Luck could happen to you too. play Texas lottery today. Longhorn weekly with coach Sark from here. Pluckers, the West campus location here in Austin presented by the Texas lottery continues here on the Longhorn network and all across the state of Texas on the Longhorn radio network from Learfield. Longhorn Weekly with Shaka Smart is brought to you by Pluckers Wing Bar. If you don't like our wings, we'll give you the bird. You are watching Longhorn Weekly with Coach Sark, presented by the Texas Lottery. We welcome you back to Longhorn Weekly with Coach Sark from here at Pluckers, the West Campus location here in Austin. I know it made a lot of uh, headlines, and there has been a lot of talk about it this uh, this week. You decided to, to make a change with your starting quarterback, although you have uh, said all along, and when you started at the start of the season, you said Hudson Card would start, but that both quarterbacks would play, and they have. And then you said Casey Thompson will start this week, and that both quarterbacks will play. So... Uh, I wanted to give you a chance to discuss that a little bit about, sure. uh, you know, with the things that go into the decision coming out of the game and also the practice because it was a very, very close competition throughout the, all of fall camp. It really was. And, uh, you know, I think one of the misnomers is that, you know, we're trying to lay or place blame on, on Hudson Card for our team not playing good Saturday night. And that's, that's not the case. You know, I think that Casey has continued to perform and, and play well. Um, I think he's had, you know, five drives this year through two games and we, three touchdowns and a field goal. And the other one was we kind of ran the ball out at the end of the game against Louisiana. Hudson has played well. Uh, I just feel like it's Casey's kind of opportunity to get his start. Hudson's going to play in this game. Um, but I think collectively we all need to play better. And this isn't, uh, this isn't an indictment on, on Hudson at all. He's going to have a very bright future here at the University of Texas. He's going to play this Saturday night, and he's probably going to play more throughout the season. He may even start more throughout the season. We'll see. We, we're going to get through this game and continue to uh, kind of go through this as a work in progress, as, as you touched on. You know, uh, one thing that I thought was also interesting when, when folks were talking to Casey about, did you get frustrated, is this and that? And he said, no. I mean, it, it's a little disappointing at first when you don't get it, but then I – had a moment with myself where I said, I got to go back to work, rededicate myself and see if I can, you know, uh, change things on my own later on. And that's kind of what coaches are always asking for anyway out of guys. They want this to be a constant competition for all positions. We fixate on quarterbacks, but you want competition for your right guard. You want competition for your weak side linebacker. I mean, you want competition across the board, don't you? Without a doubt. I mean, I think that that's, you know, if, if you could instill that and get that kind of really into your program, the sooner you can do it, um, that's what drives, you know, all of us as competitors knowing I need to perform so that because if I don't, the guy behind me is as good or better, and, and he may perform when he gets his opportunity. So you continue to drive yourself. You continue to work and do the necessary things to be the best that you can be and not worry about what the outcome is going to be or how many plays you're going to get or how many opportunities you're going to get. It's about what, it, what did you do with your opportunity when it was presented to you. Maybe five plays, it may be 50. But, man, if those five plays are great, you know you can rest easy. I put myself in position to have success. You know, uh, one of the other things I think is a misnomer. Folks feel like if there's competition between a couple of guys for a position, there's animosity between them. And when I hear 
uh, Hudson and Casey talk. I mean, these are guys that get along great, good friends, and try to help one another. Well, without a doubt. I mean, I, I think that, first of all, there's a, there's a great deal of respect for one another and the work that they put in. And I've been saying that all along when people have asked me about those two guys at quarterback. They, they've made it difficult because they both work really hard. They're both driven. They're both focused. They're both... Um, you know, studying the game plan, studying the offense, studying the opponent. Um, so it's not like one guy's just not prepared or one guy's not playing well in practice or in game. It's, it's, it's more about, hey, I, I recognize the work you're putting in and I appreciate it because you're making me work even harder too. And uh, when it's your opportunity, they're there. If, if you notice, there was a, there's a really cool moment um, in the Louisiana game when, when Casey went in the game and Casey throws the touchdown to Jordan Whittington. The first guy to meet Casey about 10 yards out on the field and they do this big chest bump was Hudson Card. So I think that speaks to the volume of the locker room that we have right now, um, which is needed, that we're all here to support one another, love one another, and, and strive for greatness as a team. It's not always about the individual, it's about the team. And, and that's the message to the guys, isn't it? that no matter who is playing a certain position or starting at a certain position or getting more snaps at a certain position, we're all in this together because we have to be all in it. We, we have to be. And, and I think that that's, you know, another great lesson we learned Saturday night. You go on the road in these hostile environments, you know, the, the, the 70 players we got and, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, the full-time coaches and the GAs and whatnot, the, the other 20 there, we got those 90 against that, you know, 80,000 that are there outside of our, our little pocket of fans and our band. So you, you have to be in it together. We have to be pulling there for one another. Uh, we got a couple of questions kind of related to this, so I figured we'd go ahead and get to this. Uh, one from Mike, who wants to know if there are nuances and differences in the playbook because Casey is starting. And then uh, Jared and Jaden wanting to know, uh, and you kind of spoke to a little bit, uh, what are your expectations for Hudson coming out of the situations you came out of? Yeah, I don't, I don't think, you know, you know, from the naked eye, you're going to say, oh, we're just running a different offense with Casey Thompson on the field. Um, you know, we're going we're gonna to call plays that we think he is good at and that he understands and that he executes and, and can perform at a high level, um, which would be no different than when Hudson would play. But I don't think it's going to look drastically different. Um, you know, when, when Hudson's numbers called to go into this ball game, this isn't, hey, you know, we got to protect him or take it easy on him. We're going to let him go let it rip and, and – you know, play the style of play that is conducive to him. And so, you know, I, I don't want to feel like, you know, we're, we're putting him into this game, and when we put him in this game that there's training wheels on him. We're, we're going to let him go and cut it loose and play ball to the best of his ability. So for anybody who's out there thinking that when Casey is in there, it's complete RPO game, and when Hudson's in there, it's complete pocket passing, that's not the case at all. Not at all. No, <laughs> that, that's kind of not how we operate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and here, here's something... Uh, that uh, Gerardo asked about it, and, and then we'll be start moving on to some other things. But when you come out of a game uh, like that uh, and you're asking your guys to give, give it 100% in practices, games, and school, that's a number. And so, folks, okay, you give 100%. How do you get across what that's supposed to mean to a, to a player on the practice field, in the classroom, as a person, to give 100%? Well, I, I think the one thing that the terminology we use, especially now heading into week three of a season, right? Um, everybody's got something wrong physically, right? Everybody's not, at this point now, is a little banged up. Everybody's a little bit tired. Um, everybody now is starting to, you know, school, here comes the papers are getting due. Here comes uh, tests are possibly showing up. So that things are happening, right, in everybody's life. We, all we ask is give us 100% of what you got. Uh, because you might not have 100% to give on a Monday after a game or a Tuesday. You might be nursing an ankle injury or uh, whatever that is. So give us 100% of what you got. Now, I do believe in keeping score uh, because the, the nature of football, right, there's a scoreboard at the end of every game that really tells you, did you win or did you lose? And so we try to keep score in the classroom as well. Um, so we, have a, we, we do keep a point system at, with class attendance and turning assignments in and, and tutoring and things of that nature so that that way they can see it, that it's really like, okay, well, I did miss two classes. That, that was not 100% of what you had, 
right? And so that way is something tangible they can hold on to. So that's, that's kind of our mechanism for going through it. All right. Uh, we have some other things we get to. We'll do that coming up. More of your questions as well as we continue with Longhorn Weekly with Coach Sark coming away here from Pluckers, the West Campus location here in Austin, presented by the Texas Lottery. We'll continue in a moment. Jay turns it center of the field down at the 26 yard line. Well, it's a good thing BJ had it because if it had got beyond him, he might have been running free for a touchdown for Arkansas. I believe Traylon Burks was the intended target. And what an acrobatic move by BJ Foster to pull it in with one arm and give the ball over to Texas. We welcome you back to Longhorn Weekly with Coach Sark here from Pluckers. The West Campus location has said on the call an acrobatic move by B.J. Foster. It was quite that in the game. It was a heck of an interception. And uh, it was funny. I actually met with B.J. today because I've, I've been really proud of him and the progress he's made in, in the time that we've been here. And when I told him, I said, I think there's more in there. I, re I really believe that about him. I, I think he has a chance to be a very special player for us. We've played, he's played really well through the first two games. Um, and so now we're just trying to drive him to another level because I think there's even more in there for him. Is that one of the major challenges for coaches is drawing more out of guys, getting them, getting them to believe they've got more to give. They might think, hey, I've, I'm maxed out. I'm doing everything I can. And you as a coach feel that you can see more in them, but you've got to get out between you and the coaching staff. Is that one of the biggest challenges of coaches? I think so, because inevitably you, they're getting uncomfortable to go into that space, right? If they're, everything's kind of going good and they're playing pretty good, that's comfortable. And to go to a whole nother level of play or a student or person, whatever that is, we have to get uncomfortable again to expand our own comfort zone to, to find that space. And some people, you know, they're, they're reaching whatever their ceiling is. That, that, hey, this is about as good as he could be. I mean, we're, we're maxing this thing out. But there's other ones you're like, I think there's more. And here's how we're going to try to get it out of you. This is what we're going to try to do. And uh, I think he's definitely one of those guys. You ever have one of those situations where you think, well, we've about hit the ceiling with this young man. He's done about, and all of a sudden he surprises you with what he could do? No doubt. I've, I definitely have seen it. You know, the, the guy that stands out to me for this one, Back in the day when we were at USC was Clay Matthews. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, Clay Matthews showed up at USC as a walk-on. And it was like, you know, hey, this guy, he's, he's, he's kind of got better from year one to year two, put on some weight. Then it was, hey, he's a pretty good pass rusher. Then all of a sudden, this guy's he's not an All-American kind of linebacker. Next thing you know, he's an All-Pro. And the whole <laughs> thing, it was like, it just kept, it just kept going for him. And uh, so, yeah, I, that has happened. And I, he's not the only one. But you, you see it happen and it's like that's why we coach and that's why we try to just keep helping these kids because you never know which one is going to take it and run now i am not in any way shape or form comparing luke brockemeyer to, to, to clay matthews however the the trek of what you're describing is similar a guy who arrived on campus as a walk-on and has worked hard to be able to put himself in a position to be a starting linebacker for you. he really has and and not only that with that comes that kind of self-confidence and it comes, um, you know, I think you, you, you see it in just kind of his body language and his demeanor. And I think there's a level of respect from his teammates. And w what oddly enough happened some Saturday night, you know, he kind of got a stinger going. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw that, yep. him having to come in and out of the game a little bit. And I think that had a little effect on us because he's become kind of that much of a leader for us on that defensive side of the ball that – him almost not being there at some critical moments, I think had an effect on us in the game. Uh, it, it looks like you're also starting to develop that depth that you really want to show. There's a couple of guys that come to mind for me. Jade Barron on, on one corner for you, backing up Deshaun. And then uh, Jaron Thompson, who's kind of become interchangeable with Brendan Schooler at your safety. Really has. I'm, I'm very proud of, of Jade and, and, and uh, Jaron Thompson. And Jaron Thompson really is a jack of all trades. I mean, he's playing the nickel, the star position. He's playing both safety spots. Um, you know, I think Anthony Cook has been really a pleasant surprise from the end of spring to where he is now and the level of which he's playing at. So uh, we've brought a pretty good mix right there. We already talked about BJ and, mm -hmm. and Schooler. And a lot of the stuff with a lot of these guys I'm mentioning is not just what they're doing on defense. These guys are playing a lot on special teams. And, you know, Schooler is, is kind of a, a core guy for us. Um, 
you know, BJ's out there. You know, Jaron Thompson's a core guy for us. Obviously, you know, Deshaun Jamison returning kicks and punts. So these guys are all kind of playing for us and playing a lot of snaps. And so we're, we need that depth to continue to rise for us. What would you say is the most cha or more challenging to be able to cross train at? Your star position, your safeties, corners, uh, your, your boundary safety. Is there one uh, area if from one position to cross train to another that's a little more of a leap than say two other ones well you? i always think it's difficult to be a star mm -hmm. and be a safety because the, the reason i say that is because at star you have to play man-to-man -man coverage and you have to play man-to-man -man coverage on a wide receiver the majority of the time that's not a it's not a tight end which you know, you can manufacture that with some of the safeties where you're, you're playing man-to-man -man on a tight end. But at that position, you're asked to play like a corner in man coverage, but yet tackle like a safety against all the run game and different things and, and then how you drop in your zone coverage. So I think that position really is the one that has to cross-train because you have to play like a, like a corner, but yet you have to play like a safety and you have to do them both really well for us to for us to be successful. Interesting. I don't think I would have thought about that because I think people look at the star and think, well, that's a nickel. That's just an extra safety. And yeah. he just kind of. But you said there's some real distinct differences there. Without a doubt, the, the coverage ability is critical. The ability to blitz, the ability to tackle, and really understand the defense because you have to know. There's times they could force you into almost being at a linebacker type position and okay, how we fit in this run. So there's a lot that goes into that. It's a it's a big position for us. Going back even into you know Coach PK's history, you know of uh, the Buddha Bakers at, at Washington. That 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 guy's always been very important. Uh, so what Anthony Cook has done for us has has been tremendous. And then Jaron Thompson, I think speeding up speeding up what he's doing there has been big too. All right, uh, we've got some more of your questions coming up. Some more topics to get to as we continue with Longhorn Weekly here with Coach Sark. Hey, I want to remind you to come support the Texas Longhorns this Texas OU weekend starting Friday, October 8th at the 33rd annual Get Teed Off at OU Golf Tournament to the Bash Before the Clash and the tailgate at the fairgrounds. Round up your Longhorn friends and don't miss out. Go to DallasTexasXS.org for more information. Longhorn Weekly with Coach Sark will continue here on the Longhorn Network and the Longhorn Radio Network from Learfield. Just gotta be real with it, yeah. Hey coach, what do you look for in a recruit both on and off the field? We welcome you back here to Longhorn Weekly with Coach Sark from Eric Pluckers, the West Campus location here in Austin and presented by the Texas Lottery. And we thank the team at Academy Sports and Outdoors for that question. What do you look for in a recruit both on and off the field? It's a good question. You know, I think one of the first things, you know, you got to remember kind of our process is I just look at the tape first, right? I generally I don't have a lot of background on the individual or, you know, the, the the coaching staff. I'm just watching a tape, and the one thing I'm trying to find out early on is is he an innate competitor? Because if you're a competitive individual, right, regardless of the score, regardless of the opponent, if that's your style of play, that's what you bring. Generally speaking, that's who you are as a human being too, and that's who you are off the field. That you'll you want to do things the right way, you want to compete at it academically, you want to be a great student, you want to be a great friend, a great teammate. So if we can figure that out, then we start to dig into you know, the qualities and the strengths that they have, whether that's height, weight, speed, um, GPA, you know, captain on the football team, uh, anything auxiliary outside of school, you know, what do they do in school, you know, we start to dig into the personality trait, but I think it's hard when I watch the tape and I question the competitive, the competitiveness of the young man, generally there's some hole or some flaw somewhere, whether that's on or off the field, that will start to magnify itself as we go through the process. Which was going to bring me to the, the point of asking you, is that easy to identify on tape, to see the competitive nature of a guy? Well, can you see it on tape? I, I think you can get an idea. Um, you know, highlight tapes are highlight tapes, and that's what everyone likes to watch. I think when you start to really watch, we make evaluation tapes um, where it's more of any time he had any impact on any play, good or bad. 
And that doesn't mean I'm not, we're not trying to kill the kid off right. the tape. It's I'm trying to get an idea of the type of personality in which he plays. Maybe he plays both ways. You know, maybe he, you know, plays multiple positions. You know, maybe sometimes on that tape is him playing football and basketball and running track. Well, all of a sudden, this guy likes to compete, right? You're starting to figure those types of things out about him. Uh, and there's other times we see the tape where, like, this guy has a low motor. Why? Is it maybe that's – he maybe was not getting coached hard enough. Maybe it's – that's innate to him. But those are the things, if you, if you start digging into it, on top of, yeah, we're recognizing – the height, weight, the speed as we're going through that, but that's always the characteristic that I'm trying to dig into. Folks always talk about the measurables, and you just mentioned like height, weight, speed, uh, things of that nature. Sounds like you're talking about there are on-field football measurables, and then there are other measurables, like you talked about the innate competitiveness, GPA, uh, what's he like outside the classroom, what's he done in the community, things like that? Without a doubt, and uh, you know, a lot of that you get from the high school coach, you know, when they Coach, it's the first time I've ever had a 10th grader as a captain on our football team. Whoa, that, you're telling me something now. It's not just about his physical ability. It's the leadership he's bringing. Or, um, hey, Coach, you, you know, we're, I'm supposed to have a phone call with a kid on a Thursday night, and the kid, kid calls and texts, hey, Coach, I can't do that. I've, I've, got, a, I've got Bible study Thursday night. Oh, I'm, I'm finding more out about the kids. You start to dig into the personality traits of what his interests are off the field to start to match who he is as a player on the tape. I have a feeling, and by the way, uh, remember fans, Academy Sports and Outdoors is the official sporting goods and outdoor retailer of the Big 12 Conference. So thanks again to the team from Academy for that question. Uh, I have a feeling that I know the answer to this, that, that probably in your time in Texas, in your dealings with high school football coaches in Texas, that you haven't encountered what I'm about to ask you, but maybe somewhere along the line in another state, and I'm not going to throw any state or school or coach under the bus or anything, where you wondered about something, you saw something on tape, and then what you later saw or found out was completely contrary to what you were told by a coach. I know that's rare, but has it ever happened to you? Oh, I, th I think it's happened. I think it's happened to all of us. You know, unfortunately, recruiting isn't a science. You know, I mean, it's, we try to make it one. Uh, but it's hard, right, because the measurables are off, right? Yep. The level of competition, the style of offense they're in, the age. You know, nowadays more so than ever, a lot of kids are getting held back. So they're, they're almost a year older, but they're in the same grade. Or the red shirting as, yes, as high school. Exactly. So there's a lot of variables that go into it. Um, and so sometimes you can, you can get information from a coach, good, bad, and different. Um, and we try to cross-check with rival coaches, um, maybe youth coaches, maybe a trainer, um, and if they start to add up and they're all the same, okay, now we're, we're starting to paint a picture, good, bad, and different, whatever that is. All right, well, now all of a sudden we're getting contradictory statements on a kid. Well, now we just got to keep doing our research. We got to keep digging in. We got to get them around, get them on campus, go see him play in person, watch the body language in game. While we're there that day, maybe go talk with the principal, the guidance counselor, the math teacher, Right, maybe a coach from another sport who's a lot around of vetting the kid. Involved. A lot of vetting, you know, and so they'll start to tell you the story, you know, and then that's the part we try to impress upon the recruits is, you know, who who you are some of the time is who you are all of the time, and not only with the recruits but with their own players. And I think when when they really start to understand that, then they recognize, you know, hey, everybody, we're not the only school doing this. We're not the only school calling and asking these questions. So. You know, we got to treat people with respect. You know, we got to be an upstanding citizen and uh, doing the right things. And so that when you do get that opportunity to come to the University of Texas, that's the expectation for you when you get here as well. All right. So we'll have more coming up with Coach Sark as we continue with Longhorn Weekly, Premier Pluckers, the West Campus location here in Austin, presented by the Texas Lottery. We'll continue in a moment. Welcome back to Longhorn Weekly with Coach Sark, presented by the Texas Lottery. In an I formation, under center, card to take the snap on first down and goal. It is a handoff to Robinson off right tackle, surging forward, and Bijan Robinson is across. Touchdown, Texas. Bijan able to blast forward, got a good lead block ahead of him, and the Longhorns have their first score of the night. Back here on Longhorn Weekly with head coach Steve Sarkeesian, 
Longhorn Weekly with Coach Sark from here at Pluckers, the West Campus location in Austin. Even on a night where it was difficult, where he was going to have to work for everything he could get, Bijan still uh, worked very, very hard for you and got you into the end zone, too. He did. He battled. He competed. Um, you know, like I think our team did. You know, it, like I said, it didn't go the way we wanted to go, but I don't think there was a lack of fight. And uh, I think he uh, epitomized that for sure Saturday. Uh, I have a question here from uh, Chase, and it kind of speaks to that whole thing about having uh, the fight on it and bouncing back from a tough loss. And wanted to know how you refocus the team on what he called the, uh, uh, the season's big picture. Now, I know when a lot of folks say big picture, they think about the season overall. But for you and for the staff, the big picture is Rice this week, isn't it? Without a doubt. I mean, this is a... Uh you know, I always look at this as an unbelievable opportunity for us, right? You know, when, when, when everything happens in life, those teachable moments that come up are so critical, right? And, and then to learn from them. And we had some unbelievable teachable moments building up to last week's game, in last week's game, and then coming out of last week's game that we just want to capitalize on this week and making sure that we're putting our best foot forward and that we're, we're starting to learn from some of those things that occurred leading into that game, coming out of that game, that is going to not just help us this week, which I know they will, but really spring us forward here as we're, you know, got this one here and then we head into Big 12 play. Uh, question from Donnie, who wants to know, does the NIL uh, affect players in, in your estimation, from leaving early to go to the NFL, or will it help them stay longer? Do, do you, how do you? It's so early days yeah. on this thing. I, I, that's a tough call. I, I you know I, I do believe as this year cycle of NIL kind of goes through, um, you know that, that that I don't know if it's going to affect the kids that are the first round pick kids, right? I mean, there's yeah. there's some real opportunity they should go do that to play in the first round, but. You know, if you're if you're projected as a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round guy, um, and you are making some money through NIL in college, maybe that entices you to say, hey, you know what, I do want to stay, I do want to finish and get my degree, I do want to play one more year of college football to maybe increase my own draft status and continue to create value for myself and build my brand. That maybe that will have an impact on those kids kind of in the second half of the draft. You know, it's it's interesting because that that old phrase about uh, laundry money or or walking around money for a guy through NIL maybe it supplies that sort of thing. or even something like for example the uh, the image that your guys cut with the with the suits they were wearing on the, on the walk into the stadium a couple of weeks ago. I know it caused a great deal of buzz for all that were everybody everybody had a suit and they were they were all walking in in various colors and styles and things as well. Well, you know, I I, I like doing that because I think it gives the guys a little bit of um, a chance to express themselves, but yet we want to make sure we're doing it in a classy manner um, because they are, you know, they're representing the University of Texas in our football program. But they're also representing themselves now. And now with this name, image, and likeness that we're talking about, you know, how do you want to be perceived? How do you want to be portrayed? And, and what, what do you want people to see when they see you? Uh, and we want to make sure that we're providing them an opportunity to be first class, to know that, hey, you're, we're first class upstanding individuals on our team, somebody that, hey, if you want to align with and work with, here's a great student, here's a great person, here's a really good player, like carries himself well, those are all you know, things we're trying to put in place to help them, you know, have those opportunities and take advantage of when they present themselves. We have a question from Heather. Is Heather still here in the restaurant? We have a question from Heather. Heather uh, asked a question. There's Heather. And, and there, there's a reason why I'm, why I'm, I'm going to read this and I think why. She's, she wants to know what's the best concert you've ever attended. Are you asking this because you're going to the Eric Clapton show tonight? Because my fiance and I are going after the show. We're going over to see Eric Clapton. But I didn't know at the Irwin Center. Know, are, you, are you going to that? Okay. So do you have a best concert you ever went to? I'm out. Um, you know who I saw uh, that I, I didn't know if I was going to love it because I had no idea. I knew, I mean, I listened to their music, but I didn't know that their show would be this good. It was Coldplay. They were, they were fantastic. Um, he was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like... What a what a show! But the theatrics, everything that went into it, it was it was pretty amazing. Okay, all right. So there, you, there's your answer. Coldplay is there on that. Uh, coming up, uh, we'll get Coach Sark's thoughts on 
the opponent for this week, the Rice Owls. When we continue with Longhorn Weekly, I want to remind you also to register free at texasports.com slash Texas Farm Bureau for your chance to win tickets to home games all season and be entered to win a grand prize trip for two to the Longhorns Bowl game courtesy of Texas Farm Bureau Insurance. That's texasports.com slash Texas Farm Bureau. Good luck. More of Longhorn Weekly with Coach Sark coming up on the Longhorn Network and the Longhorn Radio Network from Learfield. This is Longhorn Weekly with Coach Sark from Pluckers, the West Campus location here in Austin, and uh, presented by the Texas Lottery. Rice Owls uh, come to town this week. Is this one of those 0-2 teams that people say 0-2 better than 0-2 based on what you've seen on tape? Well, turn on the Arkansas game from two weeks ago. Uh, they're leading the game in the fourth quarter or just going into the fourth quarter. Uh, we're playing really sound, really good defense, kind of controlling the game offensively, you know, you know lining up. Old school two back eye formation, running the ISO play and the power play, and the game ultimately got away from them. So they're they're more than plenty capable to, you know, to to keep games around against quality opponents on the road, like like we saw with Arkansas. And really, in the Houston game last week, they were playing pretty good. It was the two block punts that kind of got them in trouble, and then ultimately, uh, you know, the turnovers offensively. But that game, the score may not be as indicative of kind of how the game went. In, in visiting with Coach Bloomgren this week, uh, he talked about his quarterback situation in similar measures to your quarterback situation in that he's got two guys, he likes both guys, he's played both guys, but is kind of shaking things up or at least made a change based to see what would happen there, whether it be Luke McCaffrey or Wiley Green. Yeah, Wiley Green obviously you know played the first ball game uh, and then Luke came back and played the, the last one against Houston. Um, you know, the, the one kind of wild card in here is that with Luke McCaffrey is we all know the, the lineage there of the family and, you know, his brother Christian and all that, but really athletic young man who can extend plays. And so, you know, he provides a little different, little different style uh, to their offense that uh, we need to be aware of. I mean, he, he started games at Nebraska and won games for them there. So uh, he provides a little something different that we need to be prepared for. How about the, uh, the running back situation? Uh, Kalen Griffin's a guy who's leading them in rushing, but Jordan Myers is a guy I know that also impresses. Yeah, Kalen Griffin, definitely downhill, hard-nosed runner, uh, same as Broussard. Uh, but Jordan Myers catches our attention because of the versatility. Uh, one snap, he's at, he's at running back in the backfield. The next snap, he's split out at wide out. And then the next snap, he's almost playing like an H-back tight end in the core. So he does a lot of things for them that maybe don't always show up in the stat book, but a uh, very versatile player. Now, one thing, Coach Bloomgren had a lot of starters coming back, but he's playing some young guys, certainly, on defense. Yeah, he is. He's starting some young guys uh, in the secondary at, at the corner position that are, that are young players for him, very active, confident kids. Uh, they're obviously, you know, you know, they, they got a couple veteran linebackers and kind of a their star for them as yep. another really good player. So, um, you know, we, they, they're going to come in here ready to, you know, they're going to, you know, try to see if there's a little blood in the water and see if they can attack us. You know, that's one thing that that Coach Bloomgren said. The thing that impresses him most about his guys is we'll show up, we'll be ready, the line up, and then when we're ready to go. They won't blink. They won't back down no matter what's going on, no matter how far down we get in the game or how far up we're getting the game. Our guys are going to continue to battle. I know you're expecting that. Without a doubt. And they're a hard-nosed, tough, physical football team. And if you've ever watched Rice play on offense, I mean, they line up and they're going to run the ISO play right at you with a 260-pound fullback. And, you know, they're going to, he's going to meet the middle linebacker in the hole and the offensive line is going to try to knock you off the ball and the runner's going to run downhill and they're going to try to control the game uh, in that aspect. And then they spread you out. And this Coach Bloomgren and his staff, I know a lot of the guys on his staff are really good football coaches. And they are real schemers, real game planners. Uh, this is not just roll the ball out there and run whatever plays we've been practicing. They, they try to scheme you and they try to game plan you and, and give their players the best chance to have success. All right, we'll be back to wrap up this week's edition of Longhorn Weekly with Coach Sark. Here from Pluckers, the West Campus location in Austin and presented by the Texas Lottery. When we continue in a moment. Longhorn Weekly with Coach Sark is presented by the Texas Lottery. 
celebrating 30 years of winning. Play today. And in part by Plucker's Wing Bar. If you don't like our wings, we'll give you the bird. Casey shifts Whittington in motion, hands it, and pulls it back in. Goes to the goal line. Touchdown, Texas. Casey Thompson will zone read, put it in the belly of B. John Robinson, pulled it back out, and raced it in for six. Thompson shifting Joshua Moore in motion. Has the snap. Rolls to the right. Thompson looking. Under pressure. Looks. He'll tuck it in. Down to the goal line. Touchdown, Texas. Casey Thompson does it himself on fourth and goal. Took a couple of hard hits to get the ball across the goal line, but he does for his second rushing touchdown. Back here on Longhorn Weekly with Coach Sark. The two touchdowns for uh, Casey Thompson, that last one there on the fourth and goal thing. I mean, that, that, that's a lot of guts and a lot of effort on there considering the hits he took. It really was. And I thought, you know, like we mentioned earlier with him, you know, I'm sure there's a level of frustration. The game's not going right. You want to get your chance. You want to get in there, see if you can spark the team. And um, he did just that. He went in. He competed his, his tail off. And um, I thought, you know, again, like, like we're always trying to do, I thought he continued to earn the respect of his teammates. You had a great home environment for the season opener. How important is it to have that on Saturday night again? Huge. I'm so fired up for it. I, I know it was really hot the first one. So to have this one at uh, 7 o'clock here Saturday night, it's going to be an awesome environment. I know our team is looking forward to it. It's, it's good to get back home in the friendly confines of DKR. Uh, you don't have time to go watch Salt and Pepper, do you, before the concert? <laughs> I, I, I figured you probably. I might miss that. I might <laughs> okay. miss that one. And, and, and really and truly, uh, your guys, I, get, I, I take it, on the practice field, you get that vibe from them that they're excited about this too, being back home? I liked it today. Uh, I definitely liked it today. I mentioned to the staff yep. before I come over. We had real intent, and um, they, they practiced the way we need to play, and that's really important. We'll look forward to seeing you at the stadium on Saturday night. We'll be on the air at 6 o'clock here on the Longhorn Network. Game televised by Longhorn Network as well. The game kicks off 7 o'clock here on the Longhorn Radio Network from Learfield. For head coach Steve Sarkeesian, I'm Craig Way. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week right here on Longhorn Weekly.